And to start, so welcome everybody to this uh, Menzies and Quantum webinar on selling against the odds. Um, the background to this obviously is um, we've been through lockdown, we've relaunched out of lockdown, we're heading into second spike uh, and who knows where that's going to end. We have a uh, recession, we have Brexit looming, probably with a no deal. So times are hard. So I think it's particularly apt to now run something called selling against the odds, because to relaunch your business, you have to have sales. We're going to do it in three parts. Part one, we'll focus on sales operation and we'll be led by Jeff Downs. Jeff, when he comes on, looks a little bit like me with the gray hair and gray beard. So he's done the hard years and has the battle scars of experience to talk about it. He spent 32 years in sales, both international sales teams and SMEs. He's also an ex Vistage chair for CEOs, and he's established his own quantum sales business, which does sales improvement consultancy for SMEs. Part two will feature our very own Menzies, Sadie Channing, who specializes in forecasting and business planning. Why is that relevant? Well, if we're going to grow our business um, and increase sales, that is going to have funding and cash flow effects because you've got supply chain issues. You may have to increase stock. You may be buying plant. You may be hiring staff. So Sadie will be talking about the interaction of that. I'm sure she'll be talking about the um, value equation as well. So we've got two excellent speakers. What we haven't got today is um, a drive-by by Trump, and we haven't got the messianic moment of the mask removal on the White House. We also haven't got a guitar solo by Eddie Van Halen, who sadly died yesterday. Part three, there will be questions at the end. Uh, for those not familiar with Zoom, in the bottom right-hand corner, there are three dots. If you press on that, you will then see a menu with chat. You can ask questions through that. If you can direct them to me, I will chair at the end to ask questions of the speakers. And during the webinar, if you um, want to make any comments and rate us or offer any advice, please do so. So without further ado, I think it's time to hand over to Jeff to run us through selling against the odds. Great stuff. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for attending our webinar this morning. Um, just to give you a bit of background around why um, I have put this webinar together, I think Adrian has already said a few words about it. But yeah, it, it's it's to do with the, the economy, isn't it? And uh, having been through at least three uh, recessions in, in my lifetime, um, I've had a lot of experience with this before. And over the years, I've run several programs entitled selling in a recession and I think things like this so selling against the odds seemed uh, um, an appropriate title at this this point in time um, I did attend a really good HSBC briefing by Mark Perris uh, Smith their um, uh, lead economist a couple of weeks ago uh, I'm not going to represent he, he I couldn't possibly represent his whole slideshow but there was just this one slide which I thought told a good story about uh, the economy in terms of the forecast that H HSBC are looking at so you'll see that the, the best possible case um, we're, we're looking at GDP by the end of next year being back to around about 95 percent of where it was in Q4 of 2019 so clearly um, for some industries um, you know tough tough times ahead now, whether for you personally, you're one of the winners or the losers, or whether you're worried or concerned, uh, or whether in fact you're, you're, you're quite happy because some sectors, obvious sectors like IT, telecoms, construction seems to be, um, you know, set fair for, for, for the recession, but lots of other industries are not. And of course, it does depend on the sector that you're, you're in. Um, so my objective today is, uh, if, if you are concerned, is to, to remove some of those concerns and give you some good tools for making sure that you can ride through the recession um, and uh, be better than your competitors. 
just a, a few slides on quantum. I know some of you already know quantum and, and, and know me. Um, we have been in business for the last 28 years in a, in a ra range of industries. Um, some big names on there that you recognize from the corporate sector and some uh, small SMEs and startups as well in, in there. Um, and I was the joint founder of Quantum uh, back, back in 1992. My current focus, as Adrian uh, touched on, is I, uh, I run a couple of sales effects in this group, um, one in Crawley, uh, one in Portsmouth. Um, I'm also on behalf of um, Gatwick Diamond Business running a, a business growth peer group for them. Um, quite, quite recently, I took up a, a role with a startup, Make the Future Yours, which is a, which is a, a, a magnificent um, new magazine for uh, uh, school leavers, 14 to 18, giving them great advice on um, what direction to take in their career and to, to choose the correct educational path. And I, I think uh, you know, for our country generally moving forward, it's really important that we give young people the correct and appropriate education for their skill sets. Um, I'm also involved in senior sales coaching, so that, that, that's me. I won't go on about me for, for too, too long. A uh, couple of notes from a couple of our clients. I think Paul is due on the call today. I don't know if you're there, Paul, but uh, Paul Waite from Virgin Atlantic. He, he, he reckons that when we work with them over a 10 year period, for every £18,000 they invested in us at uh, Virgin Atlantic, got £20 million in return uh, in terms of uh, existing business protection and new business. So th thank you, Paul. Um, and not on the call today is Bill Evans. And uh, there's just a, an idea of what we did with those guys with increasing margins from three minus three to plus 18 and growing revenue from 35 million to 95 million. So, just to give you an idea of Quantum's uh, credentials. Agenda today, um, got to go through what the takeaways should be from the webinar. Go through, um, based on my experience, the sort of dead, dead, uh, dead certainties uh, in a recession from my previous experience. Um, a, a piece around um, how selling operations, or indeed you personally, if you're doing the selling in your business, how you really, in this current environment, how you really need to add value, otherwise the likelihood you, is that you won't survive. Um, so I've got a piece on that. Uh, and then um, so, some very specific advice on the criteria, really, what I've, I've called the eight musts for beating the odds. So practical guidelines in relation to the sales process for you to take, take away. Um, and under the um, heading, really, of how to add value, um, really investigating what it is people really buy and what we need to be good at underneath that to make sure they want to buy from us. And we call that funnel technique, more, more about that. Finishing off with how we manage the decision-making process. And then, uh, as Adrian said, the Q&A at the very, very end. So takeaways, I'm hoping that today that you will learn how to apply those eight musts to sell against the odds, uh, how to sell on value rather than price, which I think is going to be a particular issue we all need to face. Um, how do we, we can use questions actually to sell, how you can use questions to build a customer commitment and how to manage and drive the decision making process should be your, your takeaways for today. Uh, if not all of them, at least some of them that may be applicable to you. These are my four observations from past recessions, really. Uh, there's, there's probably some more, but I've just picked out four key things, which I, I think are reasonably obvious. For, first of all, that because the, the cake is smaller, budgets will get cut. And maybe in your industry where you used to have healthy budgets to go and sell to, uh, they are actually uh, either being reduced or in some cases removed completely, perhaps by FDs who are trying to understandably control costs. So that is going to happen. Um, there's going to be a small, smaller cake, so therefore there's going to be increased competition. So that's either your competitors sort of turning up their wick and becoming more aggressive in, in what they're doing, or in some cases, extra competition coming into the market as people might, as companies might sort of diversify into other areas to get some business from other channels. Um, all of this will result in downward price pressure. You're probably all already experiencing that any, anyway, but that is probably going to accelerate as companies try to save costs um, and, will, and procurement people will even more be um, 
at least on the face of it, asking you to re re reduce costs, otherwise you won't win the business. That's what they will tell you. So downward price pressure. And the sort of less, less obvious thing, and it's sort of linked to budgets really, is I've noticed in the past that decisions in a recession are delegated at a much higher level. So the people that maybe you're used to selling to won't have the decision-making authority anymore. Um, if, they may not tell you that, by the way, but the, but the fact is they will now have to go upstairs to get stuff rubber stamped. Um, and, you know, we need to keep our eye on that. And there's all sorts of implications in relation to what we do from a sales and account management point of view in terms of making sure that we do our best to reach that level. More about that later. So that's what's likely to happen. You can probably think of some other characteristics of the recession as well for your particular industry. So what does that mean from a sales point of view? Uh, so whether it's, you know, you selling on behalf of your business or whether you've got a sales team and a selling operation, um, I think this ne next slide illustrates what the challenge is and maybe what the journey needs to be. So add value or, or perish, the, the landscape, I call it. So if you look at the yellow circle there, that's everybody who's involved in selling in one form or another. And the people in the blue triangle there, they're the people who are involved in selling for the right reasons. And the people who are in, in the yellow area, they're, they're people who are selling for the wrong reasons. Uh, and, you know, so, so, sometimes in, in some industries, it's, you know, it's, it's for the perks or it's for, it's for the fun or it's for meeting people. But they shouldn't, they shouldn't really be in a, a sales role at all. But in relation to the people that are in selling, I've got this sort of four levels that we have observed out there. Um, even in today's world of the in internet and, and e-commerce, there are still people who, that we call order takers. So really, you, we might argue if you've got such a perfect mar marketing machine, that's all you need your salespeople to do, and the orders just come pouring into the door. Um, but that's not, not, they're not really selling, they're just taking the orders. And of course, uh, roles like that are gradually disappearing and, and roles like that have disappeared big time uh, over the last 15 years or so as the internet has taken over. But there are still some sales teams around that are in that category. And then the next section, and this is the by far the, uh, the, the biggest uh, section of the selling community in our experience, we call it the mediocrity. These are the people who are selling actually who don't differentiate themselves against the competition through their sales effort nor do they sell value what they are actually doing is they're selling on price so they make themselves busy uh, making lots of quotations and proposals and depending on their competitive landscape they will win a certain percentage so they might win one in three one in five but it's all based on price the, the customer is buy, buying on price uh, and the, the sales team convince themselves that they have to have the lowest price to actually win the business. And the pro one of the problems with that, of course, is that dysfunctional selling leads to dysfunctional buying. And, 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 you, and you, you get this uh, vicious circle of no value be being added and, and mistakes being made in terms of what people buy. And, you know, regretting buying the cheapest thing when, in fact, it doesn't do the job in the long term. And, uh, in fact, it's not the best return on investment in the long term. And it, in our experience, um, majority, unfortunately, majority of people selling are in that category. We'll want to put a, a percentage on it. Um, but I, what I would say is that in um, 28 years of quantum, when we start um, with a, a sales audit, as, as we usually do, and audit the selling operation, their ability to sell value rather than price is one of the things we, one of the key measures. And across all industries, we've never given any company more than five out of 10 on completion of, of our order. So you may want to reflect on that in terms of how you sell and how your team sell. The holy grail really is added value selling. And the point about added value selling is the ability to sell at higher prices. So to know that you're 5% more expensive, 10% more expensive, able to sell that additional value. We have a great little chart which is called Love Thy Competitor and it says if, if your price is £110 and the competitor's price is £100, thank them, love them because they've already sold £100 worth of value, you, all you need to do is sell the extra £10. 
of course, you do have to find that extra value. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in a minute in terms of how you find that extra value. There is a very small percentage of salespeople at the very, very top of this uh, uh, hierarchy here. We call it world-class salespeople. There's not many of them around, but they can sell value, but they can do it in any market, almost any market. So in other words, they're not reliant on their technical knowledge or industry knowledge. Um, they, they can actually go and, go and do that. And they're very, very confident. Um, uh, so the thing is, you may want to reflect where you are and where your sales teams are on this hierarchy. Um, but I, I'm going to make the assumption that wherever you are, you want to improve it. And I, I, I would say that if you want to maintain or improve your position in the market during a recession, you will have, you will have to improve it. Otherwise, unless you get lucky, it's not going to happen. So let's start examining some of the ways we can sell value. And that's what I'm going to concentrate on now. So the eight musts, as I call it, for, for beating the odds. These are very practical things. Um, you may want to make, make a note of some of these as I go, go through. Um, I can make the deck available. And in fact, there'll be a recording of, of, of this um, after the webinar as well. Uh, th th these are the things. I'll talk through them and I'll, I'll also talk through the the things I see that usually, or in many cases, don't happen. The criteria number one is having a pre-call plan. Now, pre-call plans are normally done in people's heads. But that's what happens with me mediocre salespeople, or they just make a few notes on the train or in the in the in the, the taxi. And most of all, even if they do it, do do it in their heads, they think about the sort of structure of the call in terms of the questions they're going going to ask the fact finding, sometimes called discovery. But what they don't do is focus on the outcomes required in terms of customer commitment by the end of that particular uh, sales conversation. So it's absolutely essential to beat the odds. You think about the sales process and what needs to happen um, as a result of the sales conversation you're having. Now in some industries that might be, you could you know, sign up and win some business, in most B2B selling anyway, in most B2B selling, it's actually a process. And, you, and probably the next level of commitment might be another meeting or meet other people in the decision-making process. That, that needs thinking through beforehand. And I encourage you to think about a main aim and then kind of full back aims in terms of outcomes. So think of it like uh, an Olympic podium. What's gold? What's silver? What's bronze? So you've got some fallbacks during the call if you can't quite achieve what you really want to achieve. So as someone once said, if you don't know where you're going, you can catch any bus to get there. Uh, so, you know, without a pre-call plan, you can't really work out what the rest of the call needs to look like. That's criteria number one. No, no, number two, identifying the decision-making process. Now, in our experience, most sales are lost because the decision-making process has either not been identified properly in terms of who's, in, who's involved, or we, we haven't managed to, to get have conversations with the people who are making the decision, and we haven't had the opportunity to therefore communicate the value. So in a recession, when the decision goes upstairs, if you're not engaged with upstairs, you haven't got much of a chance of selling the value. Uh, at the very least, you need to equip the people you are selling to to go and sell internally. It's absolutely essential that we identify the decision-making process. And in every single case, if we do a, a post-mortem on lost business, we ask salespeople, why did you lose the business? And they, they say our prices were too high. But what we actually find out is it's not to do with that. It's they haven't sold the value and they haven't covered all the people in the decision-making process. Next one. This is the, 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 the graveyard number one mistake of most people in selling, actually. They pitch too early. The laptop comes out, the credentials presentation comes out, or the, or the customer says, why should I do business with you? Um, and they, they sometimes were showing up and throwing up. Sorry, sorry about the, uh, the phraseology there, but um, so many mediocre salespeople do this. They don't spend enough time asking questions and agreeing what the customer's needs and wants are. And even when they do, it's usually not enough. So the amount of salespeople I've spoken to have said, how well do you understand that client's business? And I say, oh, extremely well. And I say, well, 
provide evidence and they say, oh, we spent 10 minutes talking about it at the beginning of the call. Because it's not enough. And the perception that so many people are selling it, it is that they do, you know, they do understand the business, understand these all, and they don't. So um, too ready to get the laptop out and make a presentation or indeed make a proposal, you know, job done. I'll send you an email, I'll send you a proposal without due attention being paid to it. Needs and wants. I'll come back to needs and wants in a minute. Um, and if you do that well, the rest is so much easier because you can then connect your particular solution, solution with those agreed needs and wants um, very comprehensively. And you can avoid presenting stuff that's irrelevant or in some cases negative for the, for the customer by absolutely targeting, targeting the presentation of, of your solution. And furthermore, when you do that, it's possible to quantify the benefits of your solution. I'll come back to proofs in, in, in a moment, but you know, if you do a good job on needs and wants, you don't say things like we will improve your productivity and things will be much happier. You will say, based on our conversation, our solution will improve your productivity by 3%. That's gonna make you 200,000 pounds a year in extra profit. If you do it well, you can quantify the benefits of your solution. And yet using appropriate proofs. So if a, a testimonial, a testimonial, for example, if that reinforces the benefit you've been talking about, you can use the appropriate one. If there's something on your website, if there's a brochure, if there's some sort of trial that you need to do, but only if it's proving the benefits that you've agreed. A lot of people make the mistake of thinking that by providing proofs, testimonials, etc., that that does the selling for you. But of course it doesn't. If I, if I give you a phone number of a really good plumber, you're not going to ring them unless you've got a plumbing problem that needs fixing. Simple analogy, I know. Um, and harping back to when I first learned to sell, which is a long time ago now, we were told to sort of ignore objections and sweep them under the carpet. But you just can't get away with that these days. It happened for many years, actually. In a consultative sales process, we should be, you know, proudly be, be trying to identify the concerns or objections that the customer has and then work out if you can actually overcome them or, or outweigh them against the other advantages that they, they are getting. So we say there's only one objection to fear and that's the one you don't know about. So always ask enough questions to find out what the concerns might be. After that, Back to the pre-call plan, really. Whatever that next stage is that we're aiming for, gold, silver, or bronze, always gain commitment to that next stage at the end of the meeting, during that meeting. Don't leave it hanging because that customer's commitment to you at the end of that sales conversation is the, the maximum it's going to be for the time being. A week later, if you were phoning them to follow up to get the meeting in the diary for the next stage, have pulled off a little bit. Then they go on holiday for a couple of weeks and then you ring them to follow up and they can't even remember your name. So, you know, a lot of salespeople make, make the mistake of, of sort of leaving it hanging at the end and not getting that commitment. I would urge you, particularly in this recessionary environment, don't let that one go. For you or your salespeople, make sure they gain commitment. Get the date in the diary. Get the introduction to other people in the decision-making process. Make sure you do that during the call. And always keep the initiative. I, I know sometimes prospects and customers say, oh, that's really good. I'll give you a call in a week. Or, or, always agree with them that, okay, you know they're busy. And so if you don't hear from them, uh, of course you will follow up. Otherwise, weeks and weeks go by and you don't hear. And that's a horrible, hollow feeling because you don't know what's going on. So that's the frame, framework, really. And... We sometimes call it the eight criteria for an effective sales visit. But within this context, I, I have characterized it as a must. But I really think that if you don't f follow those criteria, um, you really, really will be up, up against it. So I would urge you to uh, take them on board and pass them on to your selling operation. Let's come on to the qualitative part of this in terms of um, selling value. An exercise that we've been running for, for years leading into this in terms of what people buy is we ask a room of uh, salespeople or business leaders, um, I, 
what are the benefits of a, a golfing umbrella, you know, a product that we can all recognize? And the guys shout out things like, oh, it, you know, keeps you dry. It's, you can advertise, uh, it's convenient to keep in, in your uh, golf, golf buggy. Uh, you can use it as a weapon. Uh, it's long lasting. You can guarantee, it keeps the wind off. You can guarantee it. And the point I make to them, of course, is look, that's not what I'm going to buy from you. You need to find out why it is I might want a golfing umbrella. And I tell them, actually, I do want a golfing umbrella, but it's actually um, for keeping the sun off rather than keeping me dry. Uh, like I suffer from sunstroke. So the point is, it, it leads to this nice framework and the terms on here that people get confused with. So you, you can analyze your products and services in terms of their, their, their features. You can write down any, any facts about your products or services. So, with a golfing umbrella, you can say it's about a meter long, it's made from polyester, it's got a, a wooden handle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Also for your products, you can list down what we call the advantages. So that, that's the things that your, your product can actually deliver potentially. And you can list those and you, know, you might have 30, 40 things that your, um, your product or service can deliver. But still not what people buy. What people buy is the benefit, and the benefit, this is an important thing, is it's the payoff gained in relation to their particular needs and wants. And that's different for every single person on the planet. It's absolutely unique. I know we've all heard the term unique, unique selling points, and they're really hard to find. Uh, but unique buying points is what it's about, really, because it's every individual, every unique person on this planet will have their own particular reasons why they might want to buy your particular product and you need to find out what it is so you need to get to those needs and wants so what is this needs and wants thing well the, the uh but those two terms um apart from the generic kind of understanding actually come from something called uh the, the iceberg principle which actually was a sigmund freud uh, analogy originally and it's based on the idea of an iceberg that uh yeah with an iceberg um one ninth is above the surface and the other eight ninths below the surface and the, the the point that freud made was when we when we look at the tip of the iceberg when we see people's behaviors it's easy to see you see what they're doing what they're wearing things they like doing in their spare time and what have you uh even the job they're doing all those things um but what's really to hard to get at is the reasons for that behavior not what they do do but reasons for what they do not the decisions they make but why they make those decisions so if you relate that to when somebody asks you a question let's say you go into a clothes shop and the assistant comes up to you and says can i help what do we normally say that's right now we're okay i'm okay i'm just looking at the moment when in fact we probably do need their help, but that out of um, territorial instinct means that we're not ready to go into the conversation. So in sales, sometimes when we ask a question, all we get is a right answer, whereas the real answer is below the surface, sometimes way below the surface. And sometimes the customer actually thinks it is the right answer, but they haven't really, or the real answer, but they haven't really thought about it yet. Um, so we need to recognize that when we're selling, that whatever answer we get, it needs challenging and it needs following up until we get to the real answer. And I'm sure you've all had that kind of conversation with somebody where they, they sort of turn turtle on their original opinion. So if we think about needs and wants, therefore, when we ask a question like, um, you know, what criteria are you going to use to make your buying decision? That very often what the customer, customer will list is their logically based needs so they'll probably say quality price delivery service specification and that, that, that list all the kind of things that you put might see on a tender and it's all, all those sort of obvious tip of the iceberg thing but there's a story behind every single one and behind those logical needs are their emotional wants so just just as a quick example if somebody says service is important, 
a mediocre salesperson makes a note. So, oh, right, so service is important. Okay, got that. Next question. What a, a value-added salesperson says is, what, what do you mean by service? What's important to you? What have your experience has been in the past? When you were let down by your supplier in relation to that, what were the implications? How do you feel about that? What would you like to happen, have happen next time to avoid that? So those emotional wants, rather than based on logic, that they're based on things like security, and security is a big one at the moment in a recessionary environment. You know, most of all people will want to make sure they keep their jobs. But it may be the more positive thing. It may be that they're on a career ladder and it's, it's promotion. It may be the prestige, the status. It may be wanting to make sure that they make a good impression with their colleagues. All sorts of things. And as I'm saying earlier, these things are very personal and they're unique to everybody. And what world-class salespeople do is they get underneath the skin of people and very quickly get to understand their wants rather than just their needs. So what I would urge you to do is, is to concentrate on getting to wants. You'll find the needs along the way. It's not, not a problem. But concentrate on really getting un, under the skin. Now, um, Freud, of course, was a, a therapist, and we're not therapists. We are in sales, and we want to sell something. So how, how do we relate this to when we're trying to sell something, bearing in mind the needs and wants we're trying to define? Well, the, the technique that uh, we use at Quantum is called funnel technique. And the point about this is this is where the real commitment to your solution, where most of it, where 90% of the commitment is built, because this is about the customer selling themselves your solution to themselves, right? It's like putting your ideas into their heads. Absolutely marvelous because people are actually selling it to themselves. And you know, whose ideas do, do people believe in the most? Of course, their own. So this technique, if you do it well, will enable you to do that with your customers. However, we need a, a starting point. And I mentioned fe features, advantages and benefits. You need to, for any particular customer, this is probably at the pre-call planning stage or for any particular segment that you're selling to, what are those propositions that you have? Because your job is, you know, the features and advantages are fixed. The thing that there is is the customer's needs and wants, and that's what you're trying to funnel for using this process. And it, it starts with a clear understanding of what you think potentially the customer will buy from you, particularly where you have strengths in relation to the and differentiators in relation to the competition. That's what drives it. And then we have this, this questioning funnel. And the, the, the funnel starts with you needing to make sure that the customer is motivated to answer your question. And a lot of people get this wrong. They, they actually give a reason why they'd want to ask the questions. I said, I need to ask you some questions to gather some information. That's not a motivator. <laughs> what a motivator is, is I want to make sure I recommend you a, an appropriate solution so I can start by asking you some questions, understand that person, agree that, and I'll give you feedback based on that. That's more of a motivator. Very surprising to it. That, the more we can get the customer on board with the opening steps of our meeting, culminating in the motivator, you set the scene for being able to drill down this, this funnel. Because this next bit might take you 45 minutes, an hour, or if you've got two hours, in a first meeting, the whole of it actually, more or less, may be taken up by funnel technique. So based on your propositions in your pre-call plan, you will work out um, what your funnels are and uh, what question you're going to start with for each of the funnels. So funnel number one might be, for example, what's happening in your business? What's the growth like? What's your strategy? That might be, I don't know, I'm just making this up. That might be funnel number one understanding their, their, their business. Um, funnel number two might be to do with the applications and, your, your, and the environment, the content of your particular product, and how, how they use those products, et cetera. So but the thing is, for each funnel, is to go down the funnel with progressive open questions. So I think we probably all know the difference between an open question and a closed question, where we get yes, no answers. But some questions are more open than others. So you need to start at the right level. So if we were talking about the weather, I could say, how cloudy is it today? That's an open question. It's how cloudy is it today? 
but what's the weather like today is a much broader question. Or what's what's happening in your world today is, is even broader. So the thing is, the, bro the broader the question, the more you're leaving the answers to the customer, um, and the, the broader the information you're getting, and you you slide them gently down the funnel until you get to the real nub of the things you want to challenge them on. And you know, funnel technique is is about challenge, but you know, top to bottom, those questions to pinpoint precise need, needs and wants. It's about sometimes being brave, and you know, being brave enough to ask the awkward question. Um, and you know what happens if this project goes wrong kind of thing, or the implications of it for you. They can be quite brave questions during the first meeting, but who dares wins? And lastly, um, we, um, having had this conversation for 45 minutes now, it took two hours, we pull it all together and we summarise and wrap it up in a nice parcel for the customer. And, and we say, look, would you like me to summarise the key points? You go through them, one, two, three, four, five. Is that right? They correct any misunderstandings and you ask them, is there anything else you'd like to add? We call that a sweep of questions. So you've then got a nice parcel with a red ribbon tied around it. And then you've got an excellent platform to move on to the next stage. You say, okay, would you like me now to give you some ideas on how we can help you with these five key challenges that you have? And that may be in a follow-up meeting, it may be a quick overview, and then a follow-up meeting, presentation, proposal, whatever, whatever it is. But this, ladies and gentlemen, is, is where it's at. It's what you, this is what your, your sales teams need to be doing, particularly in this recessionary environment. Just to, for the last section, just to um, address the area of, of the decision making process, which, as I was saying earlier, um, is likely to change. It's likely to go up the ladder. It's probably likely to get a little bit more complicated with different types of people involved. So there's just a bit of vocabulary here for you, really, a, a framework around the different types of decision makers there are, and also some tools for working out what's their attitude towards buying something from you. You've now seen something like this before. So the first decision maker type is a sanction. And this is the person, as the name implies, who uh, actually has the sign off. They're, they're actually, it's normally, normally one person, occasionally a committee, but normally one person. They're the only person that can actually say yes. Well, that's the sanction. And sometimes we're dealing with those people, which, which is fantastic, but often, we're not, we're dealing with the filter. These are the people who can make recommendations. As the name suggests, they're looking at the options, they're filtering people in, they're filtering people out. So these people, they can, they can say no, but they can't say yes. You've got to get beyond the filter to, to the sanction. And as I sort of alluded to earlier, sometimes the, uh, the filter maybe used to be the sanction, and they're still telling you they're the sanction, but in fact they're not. So we need to try to get that if we can. Often ignored in the stakeholder mix is the beneficiary of your products and services. So these are the people who are sometimes called user buyers, the, the people whose da daily work and daily lives will be affected by what is actually bought by the company in the end. So if they buy a pup, you see these, these guys who have to put up with all the problems. So what follows from that is if you can get beneficiaries on board with your particular solution, they can be an internal advocate for you um, and they, they, they can re really um, scream for your solution. For, furthermore, even if they don't do that, you can use them as examples to talk about how having your product is going to improve the, their productivity or you know the, their quality of life, whatever it is. So ignore the beneficiaries at your peril. They're really useful people to get, get on board. And last but not least, um, I'm, I'm sure you've all got these contacts. We call them guides, they're sometimes called coaches. Um, the, these are the people who can uh, um, provide you with information, maybe information about the decision-making process, what's really going on in the business, and all, all of those things. So think about those categories in relation to um, your sales process and people you're talking to. In terms of attitudes, very quickly, um, you're, some people you sell to are receptive, they've got a problem, they've got, got a gap, they see the gap, they want to do something about it. Um, and as a good place to be, if they, if they can see they've got something to achieve and your solution might help, happy days. But some, some people, they may see a gap, but they're under so much pressure 
And I'm sure you've met a lot of people like that, that you can't even get any time with them in the diary. And it's almost impossible to have a sales conversation with them. So with those people, sometimes you, you just have to wait until they're not so busy, but to put gentle pressure on them to make them realize that in fact, the longer it goes on, they're never going to get out of the loop of this pressure they're in. And in fact, your solution could help them um, break that loop. So that's people under pressure, really, di really difficult. If they're under pressure, they're not, they're not going to give you due uh, attention. Um, you also will meet people who are complacent. Everything's okay around here. We're happy with the current supplier. No, no need to change. Yeah, everything's fine. And that's difficult, of course, because then you're in the in the game then for sell it, actually selling the need rather than selling your solution and, and getting them somehow to see that the either the pain the organisation is suffering or in fact the gain they're not getting and you need to you need to um, communicate that. And, and by the way, um, research shows that people attach more value to avoiding pain than they do achieving pleasure. So if you, if you can actually you know, find the pleasure points as well, the pain points in particular. And then the last one, and we all meet people like this from time to time. Um, this, is, this is people um, who are kind of complacent with an attitude um, and just don't, don't want to talk to you and it might be some political thing difficult to deal with and probably, you know, you just need to find a way perhaps to steer around them and think of enough, another door to go in to get the sales uh, conversation going within the, the organisation. That's me done. I hope you found that useful. And of course, I'd be uh, very, very pleased at the, uh, the end of the presentation to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks for listening. There we go. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so thank you so much for joining us this morning. And thank you, Jeff. That was really interesting. So my name is Sadie Channing and I head up our forecasting team here at Menzies. So now more than ever, a lot of businesses are finding themselves in a period of crisis management. So without a long term forecast in place, it's really hard for businesses to be able to determine what the longer impact of certain decisions is going to be. And then on sort of the flip side of that, some businesses are still trying to grow their business at the moment. And most business owners have a rough idea of where they want their business to be in the future, but they haven't necessarily put that down on paper yet or tried to work out what they need to do incrementally in order to achieve that goal. And that's essentially where forecasting comes in. So if you happen to have been in any of my presentations previously, you'll probably know that an analogy that we like to use when it comes to forecasting is destination planning. So if you were going out for the day, um, you know where you need to get to, so you know where your destination is, you probably wouldn't drive around aimlessly like our friend Ron here until you finally arrive at your destination. You'd probably be a little bit more like Hermione, you would have planned out your route, and whilst it might take you a little bit off course, it should be quite easy to find your way back. And that's just like forecasting, essentially. You know where you want your business to be in a given time frame. So what do you need to be achieving and doing in the meantime in order to arrive there? Now, if we were to put the effect of the coronavirus crisis on a map, it would probably look a little bit more like this. And this is something that no one could have fully planned for or expected. But what this really has highlighted is the importance for having a forecasting tool in place, because it really does enable businesses to start being able to adapt and to assess consequences of certain decisions. And one of the most important things that you want to do when it comes to trying to plan the future of your business is to take a step back and consider where the risks are to your business, because this will enable you to then stress test your forecast to see what effect it might have. And this is really, really important. Now, another thing that we focus on here in Menzies is something that we call the business equation. And that is to increase your maintainable profits, decrease your risks within your business, and in turn, that should increase your business value. And that's ultimately what most business owners want to achieve. They want their business to be worth as much as possible. And one of the more common ways that a business might be valued is on a multiple. So a multiple of a company's maintainable profits. And this multiple is essentially what someone would be willing to pay um, for your business. And it's partly dependable on the level of risk, amongst other things. 
So we'll show you a simple example of how this might work in practice. So if your business has maintainable profits of £100,000, but there was a reasonably high level of risk within your business, let's assume a multiple of two might be appropriate here. So in this example, very simplistically, your business could be worth a value of around £200,000. Now, if you were to work to drive those maintainable profits up over a period of time to say £500,000, and you're able to work to reduce that risk within your business, your multiple could increase to say five. And in this scenario, your business could be worth 2.5 million pounds. So you can see what a significant increase that is and just how powerful it is to work on both sides of that business equation. Now, I'm sure many of you are probably thinking, well, how on earth can a forecast increase my profits and decrease my risk? And this is kind of what we're gonna be touching on today. So please don't get lost in the details of um, the numbers here. Um, I will talk you through and direct your eyes where they need to go. This is a completely made up example of a profit and loss budget for a toy store. Um, I've shown this quarterly along the top as you can see. Um, I would always recommend that you do a monthly forecast. I've sh purely shown it quarterly here just so it's a little bit clearer on the screen. Um, but as we can see here it's just your usual profit and loss. We've got some sales here so we've got some sales in store and some sales online. We've got our direct purchases, some shipping costs, um, our direct wages here, and then just the usual kind of admin costs that I'm sure you're used to seeing. So some admin wages, rent, if we jump down a little bit, telephone costs, advertising. Here we have four September 21. Now, a lot of people often wonder what the point of a profit and loss forecast is, to be candid, as no one can really predict the future, which is completely true. But the importance of a profit and loss forecast is that it's your best guess at that moment in time. And this can be changed and amended as time goes on and things change. So you would kind of keep it live, you wouldn't just keep it static. If you know where you want your business to be in the future and what your company goals are, what do you need to be achieving on an incremental basis in order to reach that goal? Because it's not going to be something that will happen overnight. And your goals may change. So for example, at the moment, your goal might not be, I want to grow my profits by X percent in the next five years. It might actually be something like, due to the effects of COVID, I want my turnover to be back to the same levels it was in December 19 by December 21. So whatever your goal might be, what do you need to be achieving between now and then in order to arrive there? Then once you have this in place, the next step is to track this progress against budget. So once you put your forecast, your budget together, don't just put it in a drawer until next year where you're gonna just bring it up, bring it back up again and roll it forward. Do update it throughout the year, regularly review your budget versus actuals because this will highlight the areas where the business is not meeting expectations. This will allow you to identify these areas and subsequently make improvements which all contributes to reducing risk within your business. So in this example, let's assume we're now in January. So you can see here we are looking at the quarter two at December 20 and we bought in our actuals because we're now in January. Um, here are our budget figures and then we're looking at the differences. Now, a lot of business owners are under a lot of time pressure and the easiest thing to do in these kind of scenarios is just to look at the headline figures, which are the ones that I've highlighted, to see how we've done. So for example, we can see that whilst we might be very slightly down on budget in terms of um, gross profit, we are actually up on net profit, according to this, by just under 9,000 which is incredible, like happy days, this all looks great, let's hope that the same thing happens next quarter and we'll have a really good year. However, when it comes to how your business is performing, the devil really is in the detail. So we would always recommend that you don't just look at the headline figures, you look at your profit and loss on a line by line basis, because this is where you'll be able to identify the areas that you really need to improve on. <clears throat> So something we'd always advise when it comes to reviewing a budget versus actuals is have these two columns just at the end. So the why column is to identify why there might have been a fluctuation for a certain reason. And then the action column is to come up with an action as to how we might improve this going forward or continue to do something that we've done quite well. So if we were to look at the everything above the gross profit line, so on the screen here, this is everything above gross profit. 
Um, and we can see that our in-store sales have actually done better than we budgeted, which is fantastic. So as I said before, we don't just want to focus on the negatives in budget versus actuals. You also want to focus on the positives because it might highlight something you want to do more of. So for our in-store sales, so why do we think we did better? I mean, maybe in this scenario, we underestimated slightly because we weren't sure what was going to happen with COVID and the stores being open, or potentially we put on a specific marketing campaign that worked well. Can we repl replicate that in future months or something like that? These are the kind of things you want to be thinking about. For our sales online, however, we're down on budget. We want to be thinking about why. So was this due to a particular product? Do we even have the visibility in our reporting system to identify if that was the case? And if not, should we improve on our reporting? Was it that there was a reduction in visitors to our website? How can we improve on this if that is the case? So in respect of the kind of actions you might be thinking about for sales, that's when you might want to speak to Jeff, for example, and get some tips and ideas on how you can improve this going forward. So if we continue down a little bit, we have a look at our purchases and our shipping. Now we can see that they are down on budget, but they're in line with our decrease in sales. So it's not too unusual there. We don't have to have an action for everything. And if we have a look at our wages, so our casual wages have gone up a little bit and our direct wages have gone down. So was it that in terms of our casual wages, were we busier than expected? So we had to get some last minute staff. Or did we actually lose a member of staff, which we can see here from direct wages, unexpectedly? Was it a good member of staff that we lost? Why did we lose them? If we're losing good members of staff, what can we do to try and keep our key members of staff with us? So these are the kind of things that we want to be thinking about. And as you can already see, if we had just focused on this one figure, the fact that we were very, very slightly down on gross profit by £552, we would have missed out on so much detail that we can really be working on to improve um, our gross profit and also reduce some of the risk within our business. So you do the exact same thing with your overheads. You would go down on a line by line basis. I won't take you through all of these, <clears throat> um, but you'll have a think about where you can make some cost savings anywhere. When was the last time you explored the marketing for things like insurance cover? And um, which is our insurance here. Are we actually paying over the odds for what we need to, for the cover that we need? Um, in terms of marketing, which is down here, is our current marketing plan effective? Are we actually, are we able to do a comparison between the amount of profit is being generated from the marketing that we're currently doing? Do again, do we want to go to the market and see what else is out there for us? Maybe there's a team that can do so much more that we're just not aware of at the moment. So I only picked out a couple of things, um, but whilst we are on here, one of the things I did want to touch on in particular is sort of depreciation, which kind of links into um, bank loan interest. Um, now, a lot of businesses don't necessarily post their depreciation in their actuals until the year end when it comes to their accountant doing their accounts. And whilst depreciation isn't cash affecting, it does have an effect on our distributable reserves. So when I say that, what I mean is, how much you're able to pay yourself in dividends. So you might find that you're going through the year thinking you're doing really well and you're planning on taking X amount of dividends. And then the year end comes around, your accountant whacks in a whole load of depreciation and you realize the profit you've made isn't quite as big as you were thinking. You can't take as so much money as you were hoping. So it does affect you in that way. So it's really good to include everything you can when you're posting your actuals, um, even if it's not cash affecting just so that you have a very clear idea on how your business is performing in that year. So we've just spent some time looking at the profit and loss side of things, but one of the really important things to know is that profit does not equal cash. So whilst keeping an eye on our sales and our costs and making improvements here will definitely have a knock on effect to our cash flow, it does not, it's not sort of our profit is not a direct reflection of the cash flow itself. So probably one of the biggest examples of this is if you're a stock business. So you may have to buy in your stock, say, two or three months before it's sold. And then when it is sold, your customers may then take between 30 or 60 days to pay you. So that's a really long cash flow gap um, that you potentially need to be looking at to make sure that you've got the funding there, the cash available to actually fill that gap. And that's just one of the many examples there are in respect of why putting a cash flow together as well as a profit and loss is really, really important. 
Now, putting together a profit and loss balance sheet and cash flow is what's called a three-way forecast. And a three-way forecast is imperative when it comes to planning the future of your business. So this is a term that you may or may not have heard of before, but I'm going to explain a little bit more about what a three-way forecast means. So as I kind of touched on, it's when your profit and loss, your balance sheet and your cash flow are all integrated together. So they're all linked. Now, many businesses have a short term cash flow, but that's often standalone. So it's not connected to your profit and loss budget in any way, for example. And while this is really beneficial for the short term, so you can see what payments and receipts are going to be due imminently. It's also really important to be looking ahead to the future, at least two years in advance, so that you can plan accordingly. Now, why is a three way forecast important? So whilst the cash flow plots out the expected cash movements in your business, the profit and loss on the balance sheet both give very different overviews on how your business is performing. So your profit and loss being the profitability, which we've looked at a bit earlier, and the balance sheet being your assets, liabilities and equity at any given point in time. So that's how much money you are owed from your debtors and how much money you are owed, you are owing to your creditors and also other assets such as plant and equipment and stock. So it's really important to keep an eye on these as well. I know Adrian touched on at the very start that you might be needing to invest in some plant and equipment going forward, especially now with staff working from home. You might be investing in lots of laptops for your staff to give them the ability to work remote, to work remotely. And if you need to do that, that's potentially going to be a really big cash outflow that you need to factor in to make sure that you have the reserves there that will allow you to buy those kind of things. So it's really important to look at all three of those together. A company's profit and loss is something that most business owners are quite comfortable with. They know their business inside and out. But predicting the balance sheet and the cash flow is often much more tricky. And that's why it's often quite a good idea to get a specialist, a specialist involved at that stage um, if it's not something that you're particularly comfortable with doing. So when it comes to putting together your forecast for your business, you should definitely be thinking long term. I know I mentioned earlier, we'd say long term would be anything over two years for a forecast. So I know we very much focus on the profit and loss so far this morning, but in a recent presentation I did, I looked at quite a detailed work example of the consequences that would come from working with a one year forecast compared to a two year forecast. Um, very much focusing on the cash flow side of things. That's particularly sort of important in the current climate. So a few key points that came out of that um, that, you're, that you should be thinking about um, and building into your forecasts, which I'll just touch on now. Um, I'm only going to touch on them in summary, but if you would like to have a look at that presentation, do let us know at the end and I can send you the link for that. Um, it goes into a bit more detail about how you sort of put your cash flow together, the kind of things you want to be thinking about. So think long term. So furlough is coming to an end soon. So these are kind of the top four things. And what does that mean for your business? Will your staff be productive enough to be able to keep them all on? Um, or do you need to start making some really difficult decisions in terms of what you're going to do with your staff if you haven't already? It might have been something you've already started doing. And all of this needs to be built into your forecast because it's a really good example of how you can start using scenario building. So you might have a scenario that keeps all staff. So you have a look into the future and think, okay, what if we were to try and keep all of our staff members on? How long will we be able to afford that for? And what does that look like for us? Um, and on the other side of that, you might think, OK, and what if we were to make some tough decisions um, and look at some redundancies, for example? There'd be some upfront costs there. So you would need to build that in. You can have a look at those two scenarios together and start making some informed decisions off the back of that. So deferred liabilities being paid. Now, this would be predominantly if you took advantage of the deferred VAT, which came in, and which was right at the start of when COVID hit. Um, that will be due to be paid in March 21. So will you have the cash reserves at that point to pay it back? Um, do you have any other time to pay arrangements with HMRC and uh, maybe POE and NIC? You came up with um, an agreement with them or even any other suppliers. You might have agreed some longer payment terms with some of your suppliers, which then is built in in terms of when you're going to start repaying that. So what does that look like for your business and when do these need to be paid back? So if I just revert back to the more detailed presentation that I mentioned earlier, what it showed was that in year one, 
everything seemed like we'd be fine and we'd get through this period. But when you look at year two, when all those liabilities start to hit, that's when it has a real impact on our cash flow. Um, so applying for Sybils or the bounce back loans. So I know the end date of Sybils does keep changing. Um, it was September and I believe it's November. So using a three-way long-term forecast, this can really help you identify if you will have a need for this loan at all. You might not need it right now, um, but next year, as I mentioned, when the deferred payments come due um, and you've made some final decisions on staff, this is when you might have the greatest cash flow impact and the greatest cash flow need. Um, so you want to plan for this now to see if you need to apply for symbols or bounce, bounce back. Um, and again, I covered this quite a bit in the, the detailed presentation, um, but if you think you would find that beneficial, we can send that over. But applying for it now is really, really important because it will run out soon. So you want to start getting sort of all your ducks in a row if you do want to apply for either of those loans, just to make sure that everything goes through quite smoothly. Um, so reducing risk. So as I was mentioning, um, generally speaking, it's really important to understand how cash throws flew through your business um, and how to improve it. So we've looked at the profit and loss side of things and we've tried to understand how we can make improvements in that area and how that will have a knock on effect to our cash. Um, and we've also briefly touched on the importance of looking ahead long term because profit does not equal cash. But it's also really important to have a look at the controls and processes within your business and how investing some time to make some small improvements in particular areas can have a really big effect on your company's cash flow. So one final example, it's a completely different one, much simpler. Um, again, I've done it quarterly. This is um, a very summarised profit and loss. So we're going to make, we're expecting to make sales of about 2.4 million at the end of the year, purchases about 1.4 million. If we jump right down, we're expecting to make net profit of about 60,000 with a little bit of tax. Now, um, we've also projected in this scenario, we've been doing a three-way forecast. So we've projected our balance sheet forward as well to try and assess the assets and liabilities of our company. So let's take a look at what that might look like. So in this example, Based on assumptions that we would have built in, we're expecting to have cash at the end of the year of around 70,600. Now, in this example, the assumptions we've used is for debtors control account. So you might know that as trade debtors. We've used um, an assumption there are 45 days credit terms. Now, in reality, we actually give our customers 30 day credit terms. Again, we're very busy people. We don't really have the time to invest in constantly trying to chase up our debts. So in reality, our average credit terms are actually about 45 days. And when you're building your three-way forecast, you want to go with the reality of the situation. So just because um, you give your credit, your customers 30-day credit terms, if they don't actually pay on 30-day credit terms in general, um, in reality, you shouldn't be using that as an assumption. So you want to have a look at what's actually happening in your business now, and then you can scenario build to try and improve these things. So as I say, we built our base scenario with 45 days terms in terms of our trade debtors. Stock on hand, um, our stock on hand days tend to be about 60 days. So from when we get them in to our warehouse and then sell them out again. And then our creditors control account, or you might know them as trade creditors, is about 30 days, which is quite standard. But what if we were to try and work to improve this 45 days, try and spend some time on trying to bring this down so that we can actually improve these from 45 days to 40 days over a period of time? What might that look like for our business? So in this scenario, just by improving them by five days for that year, we could increase our cash by the end of that year by £33,000 just by making that really small improvement, by spending some time chasing in our debts, improving our credit control procedures. Maybe we give that to a certain member of staff. We make that one of their key roles to be chasing these debts. We're still above what we offer, but we've improved it slightly and we can potentially have £33,000 of additional cash in our bank at the end of that year. What if we were also to have a think about our stock in hand? Maybe we can improve our warehouse um, processes. Maybe again, things are a little bit inefficient in the warehouse. We haven't been able to spend the time to improve these because we've been very busy. There's been a lot going on. 
What if we could bring these 60 days down to 55 days? So again, just make a bit of a faster turnaround in terms of our stock. What would that look like for our business? So in addition to the 33,000 that we might have on our bank because of the improvement in our, our debtor days, we can also have an additional 20,000 pounds in our bank at the end of the year, just by improving our stock by five days as well. So you can see it has such a big effect just by making some really small changes to our processes and internal controls within our business. So in summary, that was a little bit of a whistle stop tour to forecasting. But if I kind of take us down the main key points that came out of it. So you want to have you thinking about what is a long term impact on the activity levels within our business? What kind of cost savings could we be making now to try and improve our situation going forward? What about supplier terms? It's something I haven't really touched on yet, but have a think about the supplier terms that you currently have. Can you improve them in any way? Do you have some good relationships with um, some of your suppliers where in the sticky times that you forecast might be ahead, you might, they might give you a little bit of leeway on how long it takes you to pay them? What would the effects be when the job retention scheme comes to an end? Will you need to review your staffing levels? Can you afford to keep all of the staff still in place? What decisions do you need to make there? What will the effects be of repaying sort of certain deferred liabilities? That's when we kind of touched on the, the deferred VAT. You might have some PAYE or NAC time to pay arrangements with HMRC. When that all becomes due, what does that look like for you? What funding is available to you? So again, with Sybils and Bounce Back, it's the kind of thing you want to be thinking about now whilst you still can. And also really importantly, stress test your forecast scenarios and scenario build. As we mentioned earlier, when we were looking at the staff, you can build those scenarios so that you're making informed decisions rather than just trying to estimate in your head what you think might be happening in the future. And also, um, as we looked at right at the beginning, regularly review your budget versus actuals. It's really important and keep developing your forecasts. Because whilst it seems like we're probably soon going to be coming out the other end of this crisis, this is actually when we could feel the most impact on our businesses with the government schemes coming to an end, having to pay those deferred liabilities. It's really important for us to be looking ahead. So what does that look like for your business and what do you need to be doing now to try and overcome those challenges for the future? So thank you so much. I'm so sorry I disappeared partway through, <laughs> um, but I hope you found this useful. And yes, hopefully we are opening the floor to questions. Just one quick question. Yeah. Um, Sybils and banks back loans no longer need cash flows uh, with the application. I'm yep. assuming you're going to say they're still as important as ever to actually do. They don't, so the government, right at the start, the government or the banks were requiring you to have a forecast in place of some sort. And then the government retracted that and said that you don't have to do that. Um, so whilst you don't need them in order to apply, it's important to prepare them, even internally, if you're not even giving them to the bank or whoever you're, you're going for this funding for, so that you know just how much you need yourselves and where the sticky points are going to be for yourselves. So um, some of the clients I've worked with previously, we put together a forecast to try and understand what that cash flow gap is going to look like for them in the future. Um, and it's been a lot bigger than they were anticipating when they've really put everything together. That's allowed them to start making some internal decisions. So they've made a couple of changes internally, but they also meant they knew how much they needed to apply for and they knew when that was going to hit as well. So whilst it's not a requirement, absolutely, you're right, Adrian, um, it does help your case. So if you were to go to the bank and say, look, I've thought about this, this is when I think we're going to need it and this is how much. And look, I can prove that over time I'm going to be able to repay this if everything goes according to plan. It just makes everything a lot smoother for you in that sense. So both for getting funding, but also just internally for yourselves to kind of make some internal decisions. Um, so I wonder if uh, any of the panellists can think of any questions that they might want to put on chat. Uh, Jeff, I know got a question for you. Um, what other factors should be put in place to ensure an efficient and fit for purpose sales operation, given that you were talking about lots of things this morning? Yeah, what are the factors? Um, I'd like to turn my video on if I can, so I can... Uh, uh, anyway, I, I'm trying. Anyway, not to worry. Um, yeah, so I think that 
the key thing is, um, I'm, I'm about to go on video, actually. Here we are. Oh. Uh, hello, everyone. <laughs> um, I think the factors are really, central point is to manage the activity that produces the result that you want. Too many people in organisations, they manage by looking in the rear view mirror. They say, okay, what was our result? And they go, oh, my goodness, it was a good one, or it wasn't a good one. Whereas the results are history, but to actually manage activity is here and now, daily, weekly. And if you can actually work out what you think that activity really looks like in terms of size and shape, um, it will give you the ability to de-risk your ability to go and uh, achieve your revenue numbers. And when I say sales activity, I'm talking about three dimensions. The quantity of your sales effort. So, for example, if you need new customers, what does that mean in terms of how many initial prospect visits that you need to do? How many follow-ups? How many proposals? How many presentations? And work, working out what act activities are required to do that. Um, but also making sure you have a handle, not just on that quantity, but on the direction of that as well. So if you've got different products to sell uh, and you've got a mix to achieve, make sure that your activity mix is correct. If you've got different customers and, and segments you're selling to, that mix needs, needs to be controlled as well. Um, likewise, there's a mix between you getting business from your existing customers um, and winning from new make sure the activity for achieving both of those is planned and, and, and indeed monitored. And the third dimension is quality. Seek, you know, seek to track the quality of your sales effort in, in terms of um, conversion through the sales process and see where you think you might be able to improve it. So you might have a hit rate of quotation to order of say three to one. What could you do to improve the quality of your sales to get it to two and a half to one? Because it might be there's no more opportunities out there for you right now. It's a question of making more of the ones you have got. So in summary, Adrian, that's the answer to the, the question. Uh, to make sure you've got a really good handle on the sales activity that's going to produce future sales results. Um, I've got another question for you, Jeff. Um, you spoke about added value salespeople, and I wondered if you, uh, I can't remember whether you gave the percentage or not, but what sort of percentage of sales teams, in your opinion, are genuinely added value people? And if it is quite a low percentage, why do you think it is so low? Yeah, good, good question. Hey, listen, I, I don't have an empirical number for it. I can only base it on my experience, right? So... But based on that experience, I, I, I rarely meet a, a proper added value salesperson. Rarely. Um, so, I'm, you know, I would say less than 10% if you were asking me to put a, a, a number to it. Um, so, you know, that's, that's... And the second part of your question, so I've just forgotten it slightly there, Adrian, the second, second part. Why do you think that is? I mean, is it a lack of training or focus <laughs> or direction or leadership? <laughs> All of the above. All of the above. I think the, the problem is, and this is a really fundamental thing, and it runs through my veins, is that generally speaking in, in industry and in commerce, at the top table, sales is rarely understood very well. Finance is understood. Operations is un understood. Technical is, is, is understood. But very often, the understanding right at the top of a business, um, sales is a misunderstood process. So what actually happens, and this has been, really been a trend in the last uh, five to ten years, there's more likely to be investment in a CRM system because it's easy to understand. And it's still, you know, gives great visibility and lovely graphics. You can see the pipeline and all the rest of it. But it's been at the cost of investing uh, in people development and in terms of the way that people are selected and recruited. And crucially, uh, management has been delayed. And to really improve uh, an inexperienced salesperson's sales skills, they need bags and bags of field coaching. And we, and we reckon that a sales manager need, needs to spend 60% of their time on the road coaching their salespeople. That doesn't happen. 
they like that they are we call them desk jo- jockeys they spend their time staring in their computer looking at spreadsheets or crm systems and rarely is there effective coaching in the field let alone the investment in in training but it's the it's the field work where the real development needs to happen and it doesn't jeff is there anything else you want to add i think we're probably going to wrap up at half past and finish early um any closing remarks from you just to say that um you know it's going to be tough times ahead but you haven't got to be your absolute best you just got to be better than the rest so if you can just get your head slightly ahead of the competitors through the quality of your selling and the quality of your planning sales um i think it should give you more confidence to move into this recession um and to really you know be the best out there and actually go and win business despite the economy. Right. Well, thank you for uh, taking part, Jeff. And uh, thank you, Sadie. If uh, there are no questions, I think we will end early with apologies for the technical hiccup during. (laughs) If anybody wants to leave any comments, please do so again on the chat button. Uh, And I think we will sign off. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you.